give the screen to Professor Hooper. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sergio. And uh, I was thinking how to uh, start greeting you and I realized it had to be the Australian g'day because uh, some of you like me, it's a morning, some of you it must be afternoon and some it may even be evening. So I just wish you a good day and uh, thank you for joining on this uh, second lecture, uh, chapter two, a continuation of gravity currents which uh, so far we've talked about high Reynolds number gravity currents, turbulent gravity currents, as you see here, when fluid of one density flows primarily horizontally into fluid of another uh, density. Uh, and uh, here there's a bit of a slope, but uh, nowhere near sufficiently large that uh, that plays a, a role. Uh, this is uh, the result of a volcanic eruption it's hot fluid, so that makes it less dense, but it's particles uh, and the particles in the, the flow make it more dense. And so it sticks to the ground and flows down uh, the ground. And we'll talk a little bit more about these sort of gravity currents uh, uh, during the talk. The next uh, slide, now why does it not work? Come on, there, here we go. Uh, it's just to so, show, as I've already said, that gravity currents occur when uh, the flow is mainly uh, horizontal. Uh, and uh, this JFM article of mine will be uh, useful. This is now a slide that I like. Again, it's a gravity current now over a <coughs> horizontal uh, ground, uh, hot air, light air, but particle laden and uh, um, that's what's uh, driving it. That uh, density difference is heavier than the air into which it's intruding. Now, people often ask me whether this uh, car got away from the gravity current. And I have to say, I've shown this slide really a fairly large number of times over the years. And every time I've shown it, the distance between the car and the front of the current has remained exactly the same. So I assume that the current never overtook the car. Uh, the car managed to go as fast as the, the current. In actual fact, what happened uh, was that uh, there was some holes in the car and the current burnt the legs oh, because they're hot of uh, some of uh, the occupants. Uh, this is now a current, again, a turbulent gravity current, uh, hot air and particles, but it's dropped enough of its particles that at the position we see now, the hot air uh, took over and it uh, rises. It's called a Coignambrite uh, flow, but that's just a technical term, doesn't matter. Um, and there were a few people who were caught, unfortunately, in the cloud and killed. And then there were, uh, as a man in front of uh, the cloud who's expecting to be killed. And luckily, it just went up into the atmosphere uh, just before it uh, reached him. Now, let's talk about uh, particles and see how they fall. Here we have a sketch of uh, a turbulent flow with lots of uh, particles in it. And if we consider uh, N, the number of particles in the fluid column per unit uh, area, and the particles fall with a Stokes free fall velocity, they're falling at low Reynolds number because they're small particles. And we'll imagine that the uh, concentration of particles at the base is C of zero, um, because it's at uh, the base. And then the change in particles over time delta T will be given by minus V times C at uh, zero. But because of the turbulent flow, the concentration is uh, pretty uniform. And so it's the number of particles over the height uh, H. And when we put that uh, two into one, we get a simple ordinary differential equation which says that uh, the number of particles goes down exponentially with a component that's proportional to the uh, velocity of the particles, the Stokes free fall velocity, and inversely proportional to the height. Now, this was uh, put forward actually by uh, Einstein initially and then looked at a little bit by uh, McCabe, but the really proper work 
was done by Martin and Noakes. And what they did is they uh, set up a fairly uh, large um, uh, turbulent flow with particles in it, and they took photographs uh, of it, and then they counted the particles, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, I always say they counted the particles, but of Martin and Noakes, one was the PhD supervisor and one was the PhD student. So guess who counted uh, the particles? And you see here on the uh, graph, that uh, there was a very good uh, representation. And in fact, this uh, series of equations, I told them. So, 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 sorry, Herbert, I, I just want yeah. to, to clarify a bit. Uh, this is because somehow that plot is, is uh, over, over the text. So this N is the number of particles in fluid column per unit area, per unit area. Yeah, the, the N is the number of particles. If you if you like, I've made a little column here uh, that has, a, and I'm sorry that area seems to go out, but there's okay. a number of particles in just a, a little bit. Uh, but uh, this is a uniform flow. We're just looking at what happens when a uniform flow uh, occurs after okay. we consider what happens to H chain. And so, but in, th in this case, we, we I, I, it's because I heard you uh, uh, saying that this is turbulent flow, but since you're assuming a stocks flow, then this is not turbulent or is it turbulent? This, this is a turbulent flow, as you see in the pattern, but the particles falling, they fall with their free uh, speed uh, velocity, the state free fall velocity. Okay. The turbulence okay, doesn't play a, a role in their okay. motion. Okay, thank you. Except making them uniform. Um, okay, okay and, and that reminds me, thank you very much, Sergio, for uh, interrupting and asking questions. Uh, and please, uh, all of you, interrupt and ask questions as you uh, wish, uh, so that it's as clear as it possibly uh, can be. Uh, now, if we uh, do uh, a box model calculation and consider some particles in fluid, behind the gate, and then we lift up the gate, just as I did in the experiment uh, yesterday, and the concentration of particle C, which will vary with X and T, will obey this differential equation, dc dt is minus Vs, the Stokes velocity, times the concentration over the height, and the height changes with time, and the concentration changes with time, and you solve the equations, it's in this uh, paper in JFM 625, that says that it all stops, uh, this is just particles, not light fluid, uh, at a distance given by the mass of the particles times G prime, the uh, effective gravity, one minus the density of the air into which it's moving over that of the particles times uh, G, uh, divided by uh, the uh, mass of the fluid, times the Stokes velocity squared, all to the one-fifth power times the area, the initial area, this is all two-dimensional, so the initial area uh, to the three-fifths uh, power. And uh, we uh, did some uh, experiments and uh, of how the uh, position should change as a function of time. And here you see the box model, uh, which I like uh, so much, is the, the solid curves and the experimental uh, verification for uh, different uh, initial conditions uh, are shown here. So it really all works uh, very well. Now, this is uh, the situation of when you have it in a mean flow. Remember that I uh, said to you uh, that von Kármán was initially asked uh, what would happen in a uh, mean uh, flow. Uh, and uh, I apologize for the mix up of the algebra here. It's not uh, very uh, good, but it is in this Hallworth Hogan Huppert uh, paper in JFM 359. What it says is the maximum uh, downstream distance before all the particles have fallen out and it's no longer uh, flowing uh, as a uh, function of this appropriate parameter, the velocity of the flow that's going into it, the initial area, um, the Stokes uh, velocity and this length P and I'm sorry, the, the denominator there should be Vs times LP squared. I don't know why when I store these slides, they get out of order. 
And uh, here it says what LP is. But this is, I like this because it's one of the best experiments that I've ever done. Uh, the uh, different uh, size particles and different areas fall right on the uh, curve. Uh, and it's a box model curve, not a super duper uh, calculation, but that's good enough. Now, there are also situations, and this happened in Montserrat in 1995, where there was a volcanic eruption and the particle driven hot fluid came down to the sea. Uh, and it was lighter than the uh, sea, even though these particles themselves are heavier than uh, the sea, they're hot and hence they're uh, light. Uh, so uh, we decided to do uh, an experiment uh, looking at, as you see on the left-hand side, uh, a bunch of uh, particles, which were light particles, and they were thickness H naught uh, into uh, water uh, and just release them and they flow over the top. Now, this is an experiment in theory that uh, although we've uh, published, there's still more to come. And uh, I have in mind doing some uh, more experiments when I come go down to Australia later today. But here's the uh, height of uh, the particles on the back face uh, as a function of time. And you see in this case, uh, with time over, like three or four seconds, it goes down and then it reaches an equilibrium. It just stops, the whole uh, thing just stops there. And exactly how it stops and what role surface tension plays is not yet totally understood. This is now some more uh, measurements. The position of the front as a function of time um, for initial, different initial uh, uh, conditions. Uh, so the lock is for the first one, seven centimeters from the end. Uh, the second one is 26 centimeters uh, from the end. So of course the final position is further because there are more, uh, um, more uh, particles. Uh, then the next uh, slide, the second one uh, is just uh, the result in log terms, uh, showing you that it's a <clears throat> algebraic uh, power law dependence at uh, the beginning. Uh, now, this is uh, uh, the rather strange situation that in some cases, the uh, depth of the particles on the back wall doesn't change. It's frozen. Uh, and it shows you what the results are, the final position on the back wall as a function of the initial height. So if the initial height is too small, um, <clears throat> then they uh, won't all flow away. Uh, but if you get a sufficiently large initial height, uh, then uh, the hydrostatic pressure makes them flow away. And that's rather uh, interesting. No, I can, uh, and this just uh, shows uh, the, uh, uh, how you can non-dimensionalize everything. If you use this uh, length scale LC with the mass of particles uh, and uh, the uh, volume content of the particle phi is known, we can plot it all together. So we understand what the experimental results are, but I don't think we fully understand all the explanations of what can happen. If I may, sorry, if I may, is this is, is at these heights when when you have a small heights, do you have like a skeleton for these particles? They form a skeleton or, or, or they're always a suspension? Oh, they always stay in suspensions because these are all light particles. These are okay. particles that are lighter than the water. There's no falling out of particles allowed in this experiment. But, they're, but they don't form like a cluster of, 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 of contact particles or something yeah, like that? Well, they do form a cluster. That's uh, the point uh, okay. of a certain uh, length. That's what you see in the previous slide, what the position is. You see here, they uh, form a uh, particle. Let's take the uh, 26 centimeter initial uh, size. Uh, they'll go along. Um, or something like, uh, what's that, uh, 10 seconds maybe, 
for 10 seconds, it gets further and further. Uh, the front gets further and further, and hence the uh, bottom gets shallower and shallower. The bottom of the particles get shallower, and they must be distributed. Um, and then they stop almost instantaneously. Really remarkable. Uh, okay, I see, I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Okay. And as always, more questions, the happier I am. Uh, now, <clears throat> I'll just say that we did an inverse problem, and inverse problems are much more difficult than direct problems on this old, old uh, eruption of Lake Taupo in New Zealand. And I've just forgotten, but we're talking about quite a few thousand of years ago. And we know what the depth of the deposit is. Um, there's thin deposits in the light uh, area and rather thicker deposits over. But we made an approximation and it's roughly a, a circle. And from that, we could solve the inverse problem of what the eruption rate uh, must have uh, been. Um, and inverse problem is always much more difficult in part because often there isn't uh, an answer. I often talk about inverse problems uh, to uh, students, which because I think they're important, and I'll tend to go up to a student and say, how old are you? And he, I always go to a he, never to a she, to ask for the age, uh, will say 21. And I'll say, well, that's, you see, a unique answer because it's a direct question. But if I go to the next student and say, what does 21 mean to you? It might mean his age. It might mean the uh, number of the apartment in which he lives. It might be the number of girlfriends he hopes to have before he's married. It could be anything. The most famous inverse problem uh, is, uh, well, first let me tell you the direct problem is if I tell you the structure of the earth and there is an earthquake, uh, wherever it is, I can calculate quite accurately what the response will be given the structure of the earth in Cambridge, let's say. Um, but the other inverse problem is knowing uh, what the structure of the earthquake uh, response is in Cambridge, can I determine the structure of the earth? And the answer to that inverse problem is no, because there are many different structures that would lead to what I observe. And unfortunately, that's true even if I have the results from lots of earthquakes. Um, we cannot determine the structure of the Earth uniquely from just uh, earthquakes. We can't solve that inverse problem. And inverse problems are much more difficult and, for that reason, much more interesting. Finally, I'll show you uh, this, which is the eruption of uh, Tal in the uh, Philippines. And you see it sent a plume up into the air, and then the heavy particles dominated and fell down and formed this expanding cloud. And I like uh, this slide for two reasons. One, it shows how good a box model will be because the variation in height is uh, pretty uh, small, only on the right-hand side. It's of course axisymmetric. Um, and uh, the front is uh, pretty uh, vertical. So it justifies a box model. And the other reason I like it is that this, the man in the front uh, on the uh, boat <clears throat> seems unperturbed at all that uh, this uh, volcanic eruption is going to move in his way. He's just uh, rowing along, enjoying it. Okay, this I'll, I'll just show you because uh, this is my favorite si slide of a high Reynolds number gravity current. Uh, taken in uh, uh, Melbourne, it's a dust storm uh, going out to uh, sea. And in the picture that I took this from, and it was a very large picture, this woman on the Esplanade uh, walking along, she's totally unconcerned. You can, she hasn't noticed that a dust, uh, high turbulent, uh, high Reynolds number turbulent gravity current is going to overtake her. Okay, now, I showed you this uh, before and I'll show you again and talk about it at uh, the end of today if there's enough time, if not uh, next time. Which tank gets filled first? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the interesting problem. Now I want to uh, talk about 
uh, viscous, low Reynolds number gravity current. And it's a surprising thing that vertical gravity induces horizontal flow, as you see here. And it's really due to the fact that gravity changes the pressure. The gravity is vertical, but at the front, there's relatively low pressure because there's only a little bit, a relatively little bit of uh, the fluid. And in the middle, uh, this axisymmetric case, uh, there's high pressure because there's a uh, big and away it goes. Now, I'd like to do a little experiment uh, for you. Uh, let me see that I can get this uh, down properly. Uh, here's a plate. Yeah, you can see it, Sergio. And um, but probably, I, probably then you should um, you should stop the screen share. Oh, I have to stop the screen share. Sure. Yeah. I thought about that when I <laughs> earlier, and then I totally forget. Of course, you were screen sharing. Stop the uh, stop the uh, sharing. Uh, and also, sorry, sorry, professor, but we also have a question for you. If you could read the chat. Uh, if I look in the chat, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Professor, I have a question. Is there a good formula that you can use in numerical simulations when you're teaching gravity flow where the bottom drag is very depends on the constant? Gee, I don't think anyone's looked at the effects of bottom drag. If they have, it's not known to me. So uh, what's, the, what's the boundary conditions you use for the bottom? In the box model, yeah, just well, see, see, in the box model, well, in all of these, because it's high, uh, what I've shown you so far, because it's high Reynolds number, the drag is effectively small and, and, and negligible, and it just flows along. Um, I don't think anyone has looked at uh, the effects of bottom drag. That's a good question. And I can't see how to easily do it experimentally because the effect of drag would be pretty small. Um, you could put a gravity current over a rough bottom. Yeah, but no, and nobody to my knowledge has done that. Okay. okay. Now, it, it can, <clears throat> can you see all of the... Uh, me am I on the whole screen now? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can see your house. Okay, because uh, I now we can see the maple syrup or honey, the honey of the plate. Uh, right. Okay, and let me see that you can see the whole plate. Yeah. Okay, and here is some pure honey, and you see that it says light and delicate. Well, delicate. So what I'm going to do is uh, I've unscrewed the top. And I'm going to now pour a little bit of honey, not very carefully, I'm shaking on this plate. And you see, I haven't done it very well, but it's already damn axisymmetric. And it's going to spread out slowly. This is a low Reynolds number gravity current. It's pretty axisymmetric already. And that's an interesting problem which I've looked at uh, the initiation of uh, a flow. But now what we want to know is how rapidly it might uh, flow. And just to show you, I'll add a bit more that it very quickly goes back into the same form. I add some more, whoops. And you see, even though I added it, not really directly at r equals zero, um, it's pretty axisymmetric and spreading pretty uniformly in all directions. You can see uh, what, uh, what it looks like from the curving. This is, let me say, an old King's College uh, plate. And in the middle, you may be able to see Henry Rex, Henry VI, and the seventh and eighth, who started uh, King's uh, College and put money into it. It's not totally well centered because I didn't uh, center the stuff uh, on. It knows uh, where the center is itself. Okay, well, that's the sort of problem that we want to look at and see if we can uh, understand. Uh, I think before, before you continue, there is a follow-up question related to the previous question you were asked. 
for the high concentration sediment like fluid mud, the drag force is big. Uh, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, but but I don't know, but but I don't know how to calculate the drag force for sediment gravity current. Uh, yeah, uh, mud generated flows are different, uh, and they have been uh, looked at. And in particular, some colleagues of mine have gone down to Argentina, where there have been some incredible uh, rock slides. Uh, and they've looked at uh, those problems. And I don't just at the top of my head remember if they included drag. Um, you might look up, there'll be some papers by uh, uh, Andrew Hogg um and jeremy phillips at, from the university of bristol uh and they have done some things there but i'm not sure that i can recall all the details i'm sorry okay i, I think i can remind the audience that you can always write an email to herbert and yeah. he, i'm sure he will reply to you guys with for more Absolutely. And, questions. I, I'll, and i'll remind myself of what they've done i i <laughs> I, I remember hearing the seminar okay, okay i'll now screen share again and yes. uh, uh here we go right so this is the problem uh that uh, i want to uh, look at uh and that we saw there and <clears throat> the point is that the uh, surface, top surface, h of x of t, this is two dimensions, varies, and that makes a pressure gradient um, along uh, in the x direction, and that's what drives the flow. The pressure gradient in the, in the y direction is hydrostatic, uh, dp dy is minus rho g, and that leads uh, to a, a dp dx because there's a dh dx and then what we do because it's low reynolds number is the viscous resistance mu d2 u d y squared is driven by the uh, pressure uh, gradient that gives us a, the well-known parabolic velocity profile which has a flux on it and that flux uh, is an important point and it depends on the height and the variation of height with uh, x and what you uh, say to get a continuity equation is if the flux is different at position x than x plus delta x then um, you uh, must have a change in the height and that's going to give you the equation for the height so the net flux uh, is the difference in q times delta t over time delta t and that's got to be the same as the delta x times delta h by conservation of the area and that gives you the differential equation for the height as a function of position in two dimensions and time dependent <clears throat> upon this parameter g over nu the gravity over the uh, viscosity the dynamic viscosity uh, so there it is uh, written again in a simple uh, case. Let's imagine we're doing two dimensions and it flows in either direction, but we'll just consider the positive value of X. Um, and it has, a <clears throat> it should be really an area, uh, uh, an area V. Whoops. Uh, now, what we can do, you can solve this as you'll see, well, you could solve it numerically, but that would be quite difficult. But what you could do, and it's very useful, is to say, let's look at the scales. The left-hand side of the differential equation must scale with some height h over some time t. And that must balance with g over nu, because that's the uh, coefficient before, and h to the fourth over L squared, because that's uh, what uh, um, the right-hand side is. And then the conservation of area says that height times the length, all two dimensional, remember, must scale with uh, the area V. Now that says that just by dimensional analysis in some sense, just by scaling, just by balancing, that the height has to go like nu V squared over G over time to the one fifth. 
So that says that the height is going to go like t to the minus the fifth. And the length of the current is uh, going to go like t to the one fifth, time to the one fifth. And it'll tell you how you vary with g v cubed and nu. Now, I haven't solved this nonlinear partial differential equation nowhere near it. What I've just done is I've balanced terms and said there's got to be in, uh, a balance in terms or use dimensional analysis in some sense. And out of that, I get almost all the results that I could hope for. I'm not going to get the constant that goes in front, but as I think I said last time, um, Snedden in Edinburgh used to say, ah, oh, well, it's pi squared on 10 or something uh, like that. Now, in this case, you can actually uh, solve it. And it's seen here, and again, I apologize uh, for uh, half of the slide missing, but here's the uh, uh, pressure equation balancing uh, the height, uh, then the velocity profile. I've used Z here now as the vertical uh, coordinate. Um, the local volume conservation, and you get in axisymmetric uh, terms, uh, this uh, differential equation and the global volume uh, result where we imagine that there's an input because this is what happens in volcanic eruptions. And that's why I was interested in this initially, uh, where the volume goes like QT to the alpha for some power law alpha. If alpha is zero, then it's just uh, an initial input, if alpha is one, there's a constant flow. If alpha is two, it increases with time. And now, the uh, I haven't told you how to solve the equation in detail, but you can get a similarity form of solution, and it's in my uh, paper. Um, and you see that in this case, the radius uh, goes like time to the one eighth uh, power. Uh, and uh, that's the appropriate non uh, that's the result, 0 0.89 times GV cubed over three nu to the eighth, T to the one eighth, and it's only the 0 0.89 that you get by solving it. Not uh, very- Sorry, sorry, sorry Herbert, just, just to clarify, this alpha is for the input, right? For oh, the it is, uh, or, yeah, or for alpha the equals zero means I put in a constant volume. I've just uh, let uh, just uh, uh, it in the experiment. Alpha equals one would be the result if I constantly uh, put in uh, a uh, fluid. So alpha equals one would be a constant flux. Alpha equals zero is a constant volume. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, um, and the reason I did these experiments is that uh, a number of my colleagues didn't believe that uh, my way of solution was uh, correct. And they said in particular that what went on at the uh, front of the current isn't taken into account. The nose, what goes on at the nose, it just does what it's told to do. With the, and uh, so I did uh, these experiments. And then as you see after with different uh, situations in some it almost went for a month um, with the fixed uh, volume. And I got a little arrogant, I'm afraid, and I would come up to a coffee after having made a measurement and said, you boys are wrong. It uh, fits perfectly. And one day a uh, man said to me, uh, gee, I have the feeling that tomorrow it's not going to fit at all. And I knew what he meant, and I'll show you what he meant. Uh, if I stop sharing and how do I, so you can see my whole thing, yeah? Yes, yes, we can okay. see you. So here you see the spreading, right? Yes. It goes beautifully as I'd uh, predicted, but what I think he would have done, he got a hairdryer. Can you see the hairdryer here? Yes. And he'd have turned it on, whoops. Why doesn't it work? Come on. And then he would have turned it off. And I wouldn't have known. And it would have gone back to being axisymmetric. But as you see here, it was pushed along by the hairdryer, partly because it was hot and it made uh, the uh, viscosity of uh, the honey less, and partly because it just pushed it along.
So I decided to stop the experiment. <laughs> okay, now we'll go back to uh, uh, share screen. Uh, PowerPoint, West 2. Right, okay. Um, now, I uh, wanted to apply this and why I did the work was on lava domes uh, that come from uh, uh, volcanic eruptions. And a number of my colleagues here said, oh, no, 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 lava domes are different. They're not simple viscous fluids. They crystallize and they form a crust on top. This may be okay in the lab, but it's not going to be right elsewhere. So luckily my good friend, Dan McKenzie was uh, part of the expedition on Venus where there were these old lava domes and he made accurate measurements of their shape. And this is now uh, his observations uh, and Huppert's viscous theory. I'm sorry, I wouldn't have put that uh, name on top, but that was the one he used. And you see these lava domes, uh, something uh, like uh, 30 kilometers in uh, extent a little bigger than uh, what I showed you in uh, on the plate here and that I did in the lab, which was roughly the same size. And it fitted extremely well. And uh, there are lots of other um, observations of real lava flows that I could show you. The one, uh, oh, here is uh, a different way uh, of uh, taking uh, measurements uh, on the lava flow in the uh, field. Uh, this is data collection on Hawaii. And you see that the uh, hot lava is so hot that the uh, collector, Steve Sparks, my geological colleague whose signature is on the right, has to take a shield. So I'm going to say my way is much easier, much more accurate, but nowhere near as good fun. It must be great fun standing in front and sticking a uh, instrument into the lava and measuring its viscosity and uh, how far it uh, goes. This is now the biggest uh, lava dome in the universe, and it covers almost all of France, Olympus Mons in Mars, that has a diameter of uh, 625 kilometers. And that has a shape that's not badly uh, agreeing with uh, my viscous uh, theory. Okay, well, now I'd like to tell you of uh, another example of viscous uh, gravity currents. Um, it was really uh, a PhD thesis of Nicole Sharp, a lovely woman who I've never met at uh, Harvard University, but she did her PhD on the fact that um, there used to be a big molasses uh, tank uh, in Boston, in, uh, um, well, the other Cambridge almost, uh, Boston, uh, uh, Massachusetts. And this uh, molasses tank, and you can see the tank diameter and height and volume. I can't quite see it because my photograph is on, on top of it. And the tank was filled and then it began to leak. And then it actually poured out, um, the uh, disaster happened in uh, 1919, so just over 100 years ago. Uh, it was estimated that the uh, velocity of the molasses that came out, which was used a lot in cooking in those days, was something like 35 miles an hour. 21 people were killed, and a large number of horses were uh, um, also uh, killed. And I don't know why the chevaux is in French, but this is all taken from uh, her thesis. So this is the Boston uh, Post, January 16, 1999, huge uh, molasses tank explosion in North End, uh, 11 uh, dead, uh, 2 million gallons of molasses, 50 feet high, uh, caused enormous uh, difficulty as you see here. And Nicole, um, <clears throat> estimated for her PhD or used my theory to see if she could understand what was going on here. Um, well, she uh, used uh, the uh, idea uh, that uh, von Kármán put forward that I told you about uh, before, the velocity of the head, 
Um, and uh, then she also used some of uh, the ideas that I told you about uh, last time. Um, that was the initial phase when it was turbulent, but then uh, the second phase, uh, when it became uh, low Reynolds number because it was so vicky, uh, sicky rather than the uh, molasses, the radius should go like t to the eighth. And you see, she's just used the approximate uh, relationships and how the height should scale with uh, uh, y, the distance from uh, the uh, point. And you see here, 20, uh, 1st November, 216, almost 100 years uh, later, Nicole Sharp uh, did this for her uh, dissertation. Um, and, and she quotes uh, the uh, uh, Boston Evening Globe uh, and that uh, an hour or so afterwards, we were able to uh, get out. And it shows the radius here um, and as a function of time and also the mean height. Uh, and she got good results uh, with that. Okay, well, now I'd like to just quickly uh, mention another um, area, uh, which is very important that ice sheets move across uh, the bedrock uh, in the uh, Antarctic, and then they float out to uh, sea at the so-called uh, grounding line. Now, they're really non-Newtonian, but a simple uh, model would be to um, model the ice as a Newtonian fluid. That is without a doubt a simple uh, model, and uh, I'm still doing some things uh, on this sort of problem. Oh, there's the grounding line here that you see where it takes off um, because uh, it's a too great a depth and the relatively light, light ice, sorry, just uh, goes up. With the next slide. So here's uh, an experiment that we carried out. We allowed uh, <clears throat> honey to pour into water, slide down the uh, slope, and then you see it takes off because it's light and it travels across the uh, surface. And the grounding line moves down a little bit, but then it becomes constant and doesn't move any further. And with Rosie Robinson, a lovely uh, summer student, um, uh, and Gray Worcester, we uh, analyzed this uh, and determined where the grounding line was and how rapidly the viscous honey would flow over the uh, water. Now, I'd like to end this a little bit by talking about some of my uh, recent research with uh, uh, Ed Hinton and Andrew Hogg, uh, looking at lava flows over topography and using the fact that the low Reynolds number flows. And we're considering a line source going over just an isolated bump uh, now uh, in the photograph, but uh, we're going to in the future, uh, well, we have already done a bit more in bumps, but there's still quite a bit to uh, be done. Now, what can happen is as you see in B1, is that the flow goes all over the bump, or because the bump is too high, it goes around the bump. And in the two dimensional uh, representation, you uh, see it uh, here uh, in uh, B2 and uh, C2. And we're going to imagine that far away from the topography, it has a height of H infinity. It's going to vary H with X and uh, Y, the uh, horizontal coordinates, the thickness. And the topography is given by D. Uh, D is the sort of scale of uh, the topography, the height, and some function M of X and Y, because it can uh, vary. But D is the, the height of uh, the uh, topography, a representative height of the topography. And H infinity is the representative height of the flow upstream. Now, <clears throat> if you have a constant flux per unit uh, width in a two-dimensional way, uh, which you will assume upstream, then the height at infinity is given in terms of uh, the flux to the one-third. And 
the sign of the angle of the slope, the difference in density between the, the lava and the air above it, G gravity and mu, the uh, uh, dynamic uh, viscosity. Whoops, come on. Uh, now, in non-dimensional terms, uh, non-dimensionalizing with respect to a horizontal length scale L and the vertical scale H and infinity, and time in terms of the flux uh, and the uh, length scale and height scale, you get this partial differential equation, nonlinear partial differential equation, the H dt plus dH cubed dx is equal to the divergence of this right-hand sign. Um, and it's definitely a uh, non-dimensional, uh, a non-linear complicated equation with two uh, parameters, which uh, unfortunately, not due to me, were called curly F and curly M. I would have used something else. Um, curly F is basically an indication of the flux upstream or the height at infinity. And I always remember that by saying fire hose, F for fire, H for hose, F for the parameter, H for the thickness. And script M, which is a non-dimensionalized way of looking at the height of the topography, capital D. And I remember that by medical doctor, fire hose medical doctor. I'm sorry uh, about that. And a different representation of M is the slope of the topography that of the uh, incline, because beta is the slope of the incline. Now, what can happen is it can flow over if the M is sufficiently uh, small. In other words, if the to topographic deviation is not very high, or it can pond, as you see on the second uh, slide, if the M is beyond some critical value, which will depend on the exact shape of the topography. But I've just shown you some simple examples. Uh, and we've done some calculations uh, looking at the uh, topography that is a uh, Gaussian in an axisymmetric uh, Gaussian. And here's uh, always for the same uh, F 0 0.1, but different values of M. So uh, the first value is 0 0.5, medical doctor. This is the non-dimensional height of this exponential uh, flow. First is a half, and the second is 1.5. Now, what you see in the first, the top uh, um, diagram, uh, is that the thickest it becomes is just uh, away from the uh, height of the topography. It's thinnest at the top of the topography where the uh, triangle uh, is, um, but it covers all of the topography. But if you make the height of the topography three times as large, then you get a really quite large, untouched by the flow area, dry zone, where H is equal to zero. And to compensate, because you don't get rid of fluid, um, the maximum height is 1.46 uh, to uh, the left of uh, the topography. Oops, come on. Um, this is now looking at elliptical topography um, because then we can uh, make it look like a, a wall. So it's an ellipse with a semi uh, major axis in the x direction of one and in the y direction cross stream uh, to the flow of uh, four is what you see uh, here. So quite, this is now for values of f and uh, m but you see when b is equal to two in other words not too long then quite a lot of the flow is stopped uh, before the topography and even more is stopped when b is equal to four uh, and of course as b gets larger and larger you get basically a wall now we calculated the force when uh, b was very large because then it's a uh, wall uh, and it's on, this is the force on us just on the verge of uh, over tapping, uh, over topping. So just going over the wall. If you wanted to build a wall to defend against the flow, uh, 
this is what the maximum force would scale like uh, with the horizontal length of the flow and the density in the gradient. And I always liked that I talked about this at uh, uh, the center of volcanology in, I better not say which country, um, but not China. And uh, uh, somebody in the audience, the head of the group said, my God, the force, I would have never thought of how to calculate the force. And I thought, but I didn't say because I was better mannered. And if you had thought about it, you wouldn't have known how to do it. Um, so it's uh, something like uh, 10 to the seventh Newtons per meter. You have to build a wall if you're going to defend against uh, lava uh, of that uh, size, which is quite considerable. This now shows a photograph of some experiments we did. And this is now a flow over a, a square cross-section and you see it separates uh, and it's going to come uh, together. And I'll just show you now, here's uh, an experiment to flow past a cylinder. Um, so uh, there's no height, it's all uh, dependent on X and uh, Y. And you see there's a contact line is definitely separated from the cylinder. And there's still lots of things that could be done here. This is now our calculation uh, of uh, the flow thickness around the cylinder, and it depends on this curly F. Uh, so that's the flux uh, upstream or H infinity. Uh, and if that is a large flux, uh, then it remains uh, attached the whole way. If it's a rather small flux, uh, then uh, there's a dry zone, as you see, quite a big uh, dry zone in this case, but as we saw in the experiments. And the experimental results in the theory are really quite uh, good. Well, this uh, shows for the different values of the flux, uh, the uh, height uh, just upstream of uh, the uh, cylinder uh, as a function of uh, the height far upstream. And you see the experiment and the theory for different values of F agree uh, quite uh, well. So the uh, summary of that is that uh, if it's one dimensional, then it must overrun, but it can pond as I showed you and be left uh, behind the obstacle because the obstacle is too big to allow all of it to go through. There are axisymmetric cases uh, and there are questions of when they overrun and when they have dry patches. And an interesting problem, which we haven't yet uh, done, but want to do is how different figures, maybe not axisymmetric, but like houses in different uh, ways, rectangles or squares or squares with the uh, vertex uh, facing upstream, what different size of dry patches uh, would uh, result. We've looked at long defensive walls and calculated the uh, maximum uh, uh, force. Uh, we've also looked at tall cylinders, uh, which can't uh, be uh, overtopped, uh, but we can look at dry patches and they're the easiest to do in the uh, lab. Now, just uh, quickly, uh, Sergio, if I can have just uh, two minutes, we've looked uh, at uh, the eruption of Macarth Volcano in uh, Nevada um, <clears throat> that happened, I think it says three killer years uh, ago. Um, and the vent was where you see here, uh, and here the topography is very uh, varied. And this is what the lava field is. And uh, you see there was a lava free region. And that's the observation. And our calculations are shown in the next uh, slide. This is uh, as time uh, goes on. Uh, the uh, initial thing is after half a day, after one day, it's gone further downstream. After two and a half days, it's even further. And after day five, you see very clearly that the topography has managed to stop the lava coming in some places. And uh, so that's uh, a lava free uh, zone. And that's just about to be published in JGR. I don't think it has yet, uh, but it is in a minute. Um, the next slide uh, is just the final slide. And I'll show you my favorite uh, photograph uh, again. Uh, gravity currents can occur in many different uh, guises. 
Uh, propagation and evaluation, which is important, can be analyzed in many different cases. Now, there are further effects that can arise due to rotation, because the Earth is a rotating system, due to stratified ambience. We've just uh, considered uh, the flow going into more or less air or a uh, fluid that doesn't uh, move. There are questions of intrusions between two uh, fluid layers, and that's been looked at, plus uh, mean uh, flows. Uh, that hasn't quite been looked at as much, but looking at intrusions has been looked at, viscous flows and high, uh, high Rayleigh number, Reynolds number flows. Question of tom uh, complex topography, which we're beginning to uh, put in. And then there's the question of granular material, which I'll talk about later, uh, but we just began a little bit uh, talking about uh, that and showing how granular material might fall out of a uh, uh, current. Okay, I think I, oh, this is, uh, I, I like this slide. I hope uh, you don't mind it. Here you see the, uh, rabbit's tour, a squirrel talking to the rabbit saying of this huge dam. I didn't actually build it, but it's based on my idea. And so I think it's really important to understand fundamental ideas and the details and the extra big constructions can uh, be done by somebody else and followed. Now, I'll just show this because we're running out of uh, time and I'll have to uh, discuss it uh, next time. Uh, but next time we will talk about which of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, get filled first. And that I think is the end. So okay. you, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. So actually, I, I, I want to start with the questions no? before before the audience. I will I will take advantage of, of my position as moderator. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to know, and I was surprised actually when you initially did, did that experiment with the with the honey. If someone asked me to model that, the first thing I will think is to consider the the surface tension and the contact angle and treat that as a as a multiphase problem where two fluids, immiscible fluids, in this, in, the, in that case, the air and, and, the, and the honey or the water and the honey, uh, they, they're immiscible, so they have a surface tension, a, a free surface uh, separating them both. And then the equilibrium will be also with the solid surface and the, it will have some contact angle. But your equations are completely ignoring that. They're fully dynamic, so I, I, I'm not entirely sure if they can predict that steady configuration. Because um, your equations are always transient, or or the or I, I didn't see from the equations that the transient component disappears with time, or it does. I didn't see that. I think at the end it will cover the whole domain. Well, you've really asked two questions. One is the yes, transient. Sorry. Yes, this uh, viscous current will spread. Uh, slowly, ever more slowly, uh, forever. You're quite right, and I should have said something about uh, surface tension. I have assumed that the effect of surface tension is negligible, and there you can write down the condition under which that happens, and in the experiment that I showed you, surface tension effects are really small. They play a role right at the front, but the front just does what it's told. It just moves along due to the pressure gradient of what's uh, behind it. Um, if the volume is sufficiently small, and when we were young kids, we used to break thermometers and get a little bit of mercury coming out of the thermometer, and that used to uh, form a quiescent uh, drop, one that didn't move, that's when surface tension plays a large role. And yeah, um, the, uh, there's a, a non-dimensional number, and I just can't remember the name. It begins with a B. Um, it's 10 o'clock. Oh, sorry. Uh, one, num one number, probably. Uh, um, oh, 
um, and uh, uh, the cells tells you basically the uh, ratio of the surface tension forces to the viscous forces. And in most applications, I'm going to say in most, uh, the surface tension forces are rather small. Uh, it's the viscous forces that play the major role in uh, what I uh, showed you. But definitely for, for that steady state where, where the honey is, is at equilibrium and not moving anymore, then they're relevant, right? I think that's, that's, those are the components keeping that honey body. Well, I think the honey, is, yeah. honey isn't moving uh, much anymore, uh, partly because this is not a perfectly flat uh, plate. Uh, right. I, I normally uh, use a, uh, a perspex uh, sheet and I put under it a, uh, a uh, axisymmetric graph paper, but I thought just to be different this time I'd use a uh, plate. Um, it is still spreading uh, very slowly. If, we le if I left this here for a day or so, it will still spread further. Surface tension will not stop it moving because there's too much of a volume and uh, even though this is a very small pressure gradient it'll beat surface tension in this case but oh, there are cases you're quite right where surface tension will stop it moving and then you show an interesting plot where where one of your colleagues compared your solution that that plot where it says herbert's is oh, yeah. solution <laughs> So at, so at what time was that solution calculated? So they, I guess they solved the differential equation in that case. They, they well, of course, uh, solved the differential e equation. So, but, but the differential equation is always transient and always at the end, it's, it's completely spread. So at what time they did it? Did they, they pick one time and then they compare or, or how no, did they? It, it's just the, the shape. I mean, that's a good question also, Sergio. Uh, of course, uh, if the uh, lava dome continued to spread, as my uh, theory would say, it would get larger and larger and larger. But what they did is they looked at the eigenfunction, which just told you oh. what the shape was, and oh. compared that eigenfunction with the uh, observation. So it's basically saying it spreads as though it's a uh, liquid uh, layer, and then it rather rapidly cools and solidifies, but takes up the shape it had as a spreading liquid. I see, I see. Well, really amazing. I, I, I would have thought of a much more complicated model. So I'm, I'm very amazed with your simple model and how, how good it works. Okay, well, so- I'm going to say that shows uh, the importance of my penultimate slide uh, of the beaver saying to the rabbit, it's just based on my idea, much, much bigger, uh, much more complicated, but it's the simple ideas that are important. Yeah, sure. I, of course, of course. So, well, if anyone in the audience has any questions, please. Is, is you there, can, can write it. there are three things in the chat. Is that uh, there's nothing new? Okay, so okay, so for the yeah for the recordings, we will post the the link later this week. Okay, I promise. So it will include the lecture from Friday and then today's lecture. Okay, uh, probably we will do it between to tomorrow and the day after, and then the, they're also starting to vote for which bucket is filled first. So one person is saying ah. that the bucket that is filled first is the number four. <laughs> so okay. maybe we should maybe we should conduct like a poll. <laughs> yeah, well, see. there are ways of doing polls on Zoom, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, okay, it, I'll, I'll try to find that out and then we can do try that to find out. There is yeah. some way where you, Sergio, can have everybody put in a, a number. That would be fun if you could find that out. And then I'll tell you the result afterwards. OK, sure. And we'll, we'll do that, that at the beginning of next lecture. Yeah, let's do that. OK, good. So OK, so if nobody else has any questions, then please remember that you can always uh, write an email to Professor Hooper. And, uh, OK, so I think yeah. uh, and we my can email here. address is and my email address is in the chat. Uh, Sergio has uh, put it there, heh1 at cam.ac.uk. 
Okay, yes. So as always, thank you very much, Herbert. And we will see you on Friday. I look forward to that. Have a good week, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.